said that uh, pretty much the three phases in his life resemble the life cycle of the butterfly. Sin was still hovering in his inner nature. His first encounter with, with God was not good enough. He went through an encounter with God, but he still maintained some reminiscence of the old nature. That's why God came to him and he appeared to him and he wrestled with him. In tonight's discussion, we go through the third and final phase of God's dealing with Jacob, which is called, so the title is called Returning to Bethel, Bethel. Returning to Bethel, Pursuing Spiritual Maturity. And we're going to speak about three main points tonight. Number one is the reconciliation with Esau and with his father-in-law, Laban. So reconciliation, that's number one. Number two, we want to speak about the Dina incident. And then number three, we'll speak about returning to Bethel and renewing God's promise or God's covenant. Let's uh, watch another uh, small video clip to kind of introduce us to our next segment, please. Let's look at the first sign of spiritual growth or spiritual maturity. We're going to call this reconciliation, the stage of reconciliation. Again, we left the scene as Laban was chasing down Jacob and he really wanted to hurt him for uh, messing up with 
you know, the breeding process of his flocks, uh, for cheating him, for uh, stealing or kidnapping his, uh, his children or two daughters along with the, his grandchildren. And God appeared to him and he said, whatever you do, don't hurt Jacob. So God protected him. But look with me at uh, chapter 31, Genesis 31, starting from verse 43. The first stage or step for reconciliation is what we call a covenant. A covenant, an agreement between two adults, responsible people, that they don't want to hurt one another, but they want to live peacefully. And Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and this flock is my flock. All that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have born? Now therefore come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there on the heap. And the story continues. Let's look at 54. Then Jacob offered the sacrifice on the mountain and called the brethren to eat bread. And they ate bread and they stayed all night on the mountain. So very important to say that if I'm ever going to move on from one level in my spiritual life to the next or take the next step or decision in my life, I need to have some sort of closure or reconciliation with everything that happened in the past. I need to cl close these doors. We find that so many people live with, with regret and hatred to things that happened in the past. Arguments and uh, old habits and the problems with people or, or work or, or friends, etc. And there, there won't be people that it's just going to be like crippling to them. We need to get rid of a lot of baggage from the past. What is a covenant? A covenant is more than a contract or more than an agreement. It's between two consenting adults responsible and they know exactly what they do. And this is what villages or cities or countries made in the past, like peace bonds between two parties together to agree that we're closing you know, an old chapter in our life and we want to start fresh. That's why our Lord Jesus um, when he spoke with his disciples, he spoke about a new covenant. And also in Jeremiah 31, 31 speaks about a new covenant that will not be written by hands of, of men anymore, but people will know what to do. And this was fulfilled, of course, in the sacrament of the Eucharist as our Lord Jesus gave his blood because for every covenant there has to be an offering or a seal. Sometimes a seal by blood, you know, where, where people kind of mix their blood together to show that there is oneness or unity now, or a gift that is offered, or a sacrifice that is torn in between the two, as happened with, with Abraham when God appeared to him in Genesis chapter 15 and offered him the covenant or the agreement, and there is always a reward. You know, if we have this covenant between us, then I will be your God and you will be my son, and your descendants will be like the stars in the heaven and the sand on the seashore. Also, God made a covenant with Moses, to renew that old covenant, and he made a covenant with Jacob and with Isaac, etc. So the concept of having a covenant here is really important for us to get from one level to the other. And it's a calling from God to draw us back to him. Not only did he have a covenant to resolve old problems with Laban, but also look at the way that he received his brother Esau. Again, the whole concept of reconciliation. Look at 32, verse, um, let's start from verse 1. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. Okay, he's meeting Esau now. This is God's camp. And he called the name of the place um, Mahanaim. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now, etc. Complete change in attitude. That's not Jacob who's speaking. It's not the old, arrogant, tricky uh, Jacob who's speaking now with his brother. He is modest and he is humble. 
Look at the two words. He addresses his brother as, speak thus to, to my Lord, Esau. And then he refers to himself as your servant, Jacob says. Look at verse 9 of the same chapter. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I have become two companies. Another sign of his modesty and of his humility. There is no reconciliation without knowing myself. Not because I'm little, because I want to belittle myself, but as compared to God, my Lord and my Master, He's the God of graciousness. And always modesty and humility resolves issues. Like the, the scripture always teaches us that we cannot face anger with anger and face hatred with hatred. But when there is someone who's extremely angry, face them with kindness and with modesty. And a beautiful smile or a, or a kind act, like a, a, a random act of, of kindness, act of random kindness arc, always resolves the issues. There's also another beautiful example in 1 Samuel chapter 25. If we can quickly look at this example together. There we see the example of Nabal and David. They went together and uh, David wanted to eat some food and uh, the servants of Nabal kind of kicked them out. And David had done many favors to, to Nabal before and he could have hurt him. So he was a rude man. Nabal was a rude man. And uh, he said, who is David? Like, David was king. What do you mean, who is David? David is king, but he was on the run at that time. So he dismissed him, and, and he didn't want to give him any supplies. So David decided in his heart that he's going to terminate Nabal with all of his men and his flocks and everything. Except there was one wise, humble woman, his wife, Nabal's wife, and her name is Abigail. Abigail, Nabal's wife, heard that uh, David was just about to, to kill her husband and everyone, so she had a plan in her heart. And what happened with her is that she was a very humble and a modest woman. Look at the way that she approached David. She sent him lots of gifts and food ahead of her, just like Jacob did. She knows that you know, a way into a man's heart is always through his Stomach, of course. It's a, it's a universal kind of knowledge that everyone knows. So she sent him a lot of food ahead of her, so maybe when he eats and he's happy, then he's going to receive her better. And uh, look at verse 22. May God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all who belong to him by the morning. That's what David said in his heart. Now Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey. So she was humble, she, you know, because those who ride on an animal in the presence of someone else are like at a higher level. So when she saw him as a sign of respect, she came down from her donkey. Fell on her face before David and bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. So she took permission to speak in his presence. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so he is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. So she was an extremely wise and humble woman who was able to resolve the issue without the need for bloodshed. Look at David's response. Then at verse 32, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice. And blessed are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hands. The quiet and calm response resolve so many problems and issues. It's a sign of a person who is at peace with God and at peace with themselves from inside. 
There's no more struggle. If I can resolve issues and reconcile with others without the need to fight all the time, without the need to, to quarrel or to argue or to offend, or, you know, if I'm a kind and a simple person with others, God can work with me and through me so much. It's a sign of spiritual maturity. It's a sign that God is at work in my life.